from summer to fall, brown bears undergo a remarkable transformation. When they arrive in June and July at Brooks River in Katmai National Park, they are hungry. They've spent the previous winter with no food and they have no time to waste because winter comes quickly in Katmai and bears must get fat to survive it. In the bear world, fat exemplifies success. It is the fuel that powers their ability to endure winter hibernation as well as the key to their reproductive success. And we'd like to welcome you to Fat Bear Week brought to you by Katmai National Park, the Katmai Conservancy and Explore.org. My name is Mike Fitz, the resident naturalist with Explore.org. And I'm joined today by my co-hosts, park rangers, Naomi Boak, Leon Law and Cheryl Spencer. Rangers, thanks so much for being here. And it looks like Fat Bear Week is off to a running start. Oh my God, it's great. I can hardly believe it's actually the day. And um, <laughs> it, I know, and um, the beginning of an exciting week and boy, look at those bears. <laughs> a ton of fat bears to consider uh, as the week progresses. And I think we're gonna try to give everyone a better understanding of how each one of those individual bears survives. And of course, uh, the role of fat in their lives. If anyone does have questions on that topic, you can drop those into the chat below the live camera feed and a helpful moderator from Explore.org will try to send a few of those questions in our direction. We'll try to answer at least a couple of them towards the end of the broadcast. Of course, uh, we've talked about how this is the you know the uh, opening day of Fat Bear Week, and we do have two matchups that we'll get to uh, more specifically in just a moment. But Cheryl, do you want to please give us a rundown of Fat Bear Week? I would love to. Um, welcome everybody to Fat Bear Week. It is officially started. Um, to any and all newcomers who are like, "Hey, what is this Fat Bear Week thing?" Um, Fat Bear Week is an annual competition that celebrates a successful summer weight gain for Katmai National Park and Preserves brown bears. Um, throughout the summer, Katmai's bears focus on packing on as many pounds as possible um, before they go into hibernation for the winter. Uh, now, weight gain is critical to their survival during hibernation. So basically, the fatter the bear, the better, and a fat bear equals a successful bear. Um, the competition is structured as a bracket style uh, March Madness style competition uh, where bears are placed in matches against one another um, for each matchup, we will show a before and after photo of the bears um, that highlight how much weight gain these individual bears have gained throughout the course of the summer. Um, now, it gets super fun because it's up to the public to vote on who they think is the fattest of all of Catmice Fat Bears. Um, Leon, would you like to tell us how folks can participate in the Fat Bear Week festivities this year? Of course. It is your guys' participation that really makes Fat Bear Week successful. So we encourage everybody to get out and vote at www.fatbearweek.org. This is your hub for all things Fat Bear Week, hosted by explore.org in partnership with Katmai National Park and the Katmai Conservancy. Now, there are a couple matchups every day. Uh, two for the first few days. So be sure that you do vote in both, which does require a little bit of scrolling on your part. And you'll also notice that we ask you to input your email. And just as a reminder, this is only to make sure that you guys are just voting once. We don't want any voter fraud, <laughs> um, but we definitely want to make sure you participate. So keep in mind that there are specific hours um, for voting. And those are 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Alaska time, which is noon to nine Eastern time. So make sure that your voice is heard by voting. And already you can see we have had quite a few people voting in today's matchups. Naomi, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, there's still time to vote today. So, um, you know, when you're done watching us vote, if you haven't done it already. So today is an exciting day. We have a matchup between two um, mega mamas and um, two husky hunks who have, <laughs> and these four bears have really different life stories. The mothers got both these, one four, four, four three five and one two eight, got fat while nursing, managing, and feeding to um, yearling cubs. Now that's a yes. Now the fact that they got fat while doing all that is pretty amazing. And then these husky guys. Popeye 634 versus 151. 
I mean, they are just handsome dudes. I'm sorry. I have to say that if you like <laughs> bears, um, these guys are, you know, really good looking bears and they've done a really good job of getting fat. So it's great competition. And we've got a lot more interesting matchups because these guys go on to um, compete with other bears. Mike, what are we looking at come after these guys um, are done competing today? Well, on Wednesday, uh, or excuse me, Friday, October 1, uh, we often don't see a cub facing a mother bear in Fat Bear Week, but that's how the bracket worked out this year. It'll be interesting to see whether the voters think that 132's cub and that cub's exponential growth over the summer is enough to tip the scales in favor of the mother bear that it will face. And that looks increasingly likely to be 128 crazier. So I am looking forward to that matchup. And then uh, that other um, matchup on the bottom uh, on October 1, that's going to be, be looks like, between Chunk and Walker at this point. And e any one of those bears really could win it all. Um, they are really yeah. big. Those uh, those two bears uh, could weigh a combined twenty five hundred pounds. I mean, they are <laughs> they are real giants. Uh, yeah, we still have uh, you know a couple other matchups the rest of the week too. And remember, Chunk was the runner up last year, so um, you know we got the Chunk and the Hunks uh, coming up. Um, <laughs> and tomorrow tomorrow is a youth. We start out with a very youthful competition. We have. Um, young bears um and um there we go and we have bear 812 who is a young adult bear and he's six years old and bear 131 who is um a sub-adult which means that she is a teenager so she's figuring out the world and 812 is still kind of young and playful and and both these bears have gotten really big um they they have they're growing up and out so and they could um, be in a matchup with um, another uh, young adult bear, Bear 503, on Saturday. So, and Mike, what else do we have to look forward to? Well, the final first round matchup will be, again, uh, starting tomorrow, and that's between two of the older bears in the competition, number 480 Otis and number 402. 402 is a female bear. She is one of the most reproductively successful female bears at Brooks River. She's single uh, this year, so she's quite tubby. Uh, 480 Otis is one of the older adult males, and he came back very skinny this year, but has really packed on the pounds and done a wonderful job at gaining those fat reserves for winter hibernation. And the winner of that matchup will face the mighty 747, who's the currently uh, the defending Fat Bear Week title holder. And I'm really looking forward to that matchup coming on Saturday, October 2nd. So a lot of great matchups coming up in Fat Bear Week over the next uh, several days. But at this moment in the broadcast, I think we'd like to take uh, a, a moment to pause and thank our sponsor, and that is the, the great Sockeye Salmon. Without salmon, we could not <laughs> enjoy a, an event like Fat Bear Week or the scene of fishing uh, or bears fishing out of waterfall. Leon, uh, you know, a discussion, I think, of the importance of fat in the lives of bears wouldn't be complete without a moment to consider the role that salmon and other bear foods play in their lives. So how important are salmon to bears and Katmai? Absolutely. So bears eat what is plentiful and abundant. And for us here at Katmai, that is those sockeye salmon that you speak of. They really are the lifeblood of Katmai's ecosystem, and they are important for our fat bears. And we cannot stress that, to overstress that at all. And it really does start at the beginning of the season when salmon are just making their way upriver. So the average fish has around 4,500 calories or so at that time. And that high fat content really allows bears to bulk up early after a lean <coughs> spring. And during the peak season, we'll also see that salmon are so plentiful that many bears are hydrating, which is essentially they are eating the fattiest parts of the fish. So the brain, the skin, the roe. So think about it as going to a buffet and skipping out on the bread and salad and really concentrating on what matters to you. 
And on a diet of salmon over the course of a season, they bears, they really gain several hundred pounds. And you can definitely see that in some of our big bears here, all of which, you know, you can tell such a size difference. And sometimes they'll be gaining upwards of two pounds of fat a day. And we'll see bears like 480 Otis and 747 just feasting on fish after fish. But in reality, salmon, we, yes, super important. And it's not the only thing that bears eat either. So Bears, they are omnivores and they are true opportunists as well. So they'll eat whatever is available from grass to berries, small mammals, clams along the coast. Um, but what really sets them apart is this access to salmon. So our guys are definitely bigger than perhaps the inland grizzlies that you'll see at Denali or Yellowstone. And to give a specific example, for instance, no bear in Yellowstone has ever been estimated to be 900 pounds. And yet our guys here, like 32 Chunk, 151 Walker, 747, large adult males, they routinely way over a thousand here. And you can definitely see in the competition how much access to salmon can really make a difference. And right now they are really packing in those last calories, eating what they can to continue this weight gain. And they're doing this, it's fueled by hyperphagia. Naomi, can you tell us a little bit more about what hyperphagia is? Yeah, hyperphagia is um, a metabolic change that happens um, in the bears at this time of year is, that kind of gives them a sense of urgency because winter is coming and um, <laughs> they have to eat as much as they can. And what happens is there's a, a hormone leptin which uh, tells bears and humans that uh, we're full. We don't need to be hungry anymore. We don't need to eat anymore. Well, bears become leptin resistant at this time of year. They, they are always hungry. They never feel full and you see a bear like 747 and you you see him he continues to eat this time of year and you think well does he really have to eat he's so big he could go and hibernate now and he just he keeps on eating and that's because he's in hyperphagia and his body does not tell him that he's full you see a bear like 480 otis and he is in the water fishing all the time you never see him out of the water and that's because his body is telling him there is an urgency to keep on eating before he has to go into hibernation another thing to watch with these bears is the behavior of the cubs um watch the fat bear junior winner that cub 132's cub is going to be more demanding of mom it's going to want to nurse more it's going to be vocal because it too is in hyperphagia and feeling a really urgent need to eat. So um, this is what's going on with the bears now. And that's why we need to celebrate their hard effort and their, um, their success so far. So, um, but next Mike, um, we wanna talk about what growth means to, to bears of different ages. And, and we have lots of, bears of different ages in this group. Um, you want to tell us what, what this growth and fatness means to, um, to a bear like 132's cub? Absolutely. You know, we've talked about how bears get fat, but there's another side to that story to consider. And, th and that is why do they get fat? Take, you know, you could take cubs, for example, like 132's cub. No other class of bear comes close to experiencing the growth rate of cubs, especially during their first year. I, I think one through two's cub is a great example. This is a, that family from uh, June. So small, vulnerable looking, but that cub has actually grown uh, considerably even by the time we saw, saw them in June. When a cub is born in midwinter inside mother's den at birth, it weighs about a pound and it's really about the size of a soup can. So here it is, here's a baby bear <laughs> at birth the biggest, baddest bear that you've ever seen was once this size, right? So, you know, it's not, they're not giant. You know, I could hold up to the screen. Oh my God, they're so big. No, they're pretty, they're really, really small uh, when they're born. By the time they leave the den though, uh, they might've weighed, you know, 12 to 20 pounds. Uh, by early summer, the cubs 
of this age, they experience a tremendous growth spurt. It's demand for mother's milk and other foods really skyrockets as it continues to gain size and mass. And by late summer, so this time of the year and early fall, it's not uncommon for first year cubs to weigh 60 to 70 or more pounds. And all of this effort is aimed toward the future. Increased body size will help 132's cub survive and endure the challenges posed by the environment as well as wintertime hibernation. In fact, only newborn cubs suckle milk in the den. All the cubs that we see on the landscape now, including 132's cub, must survive winter on their fat reserves like mother. So cubs get fat to survive, but so do those subadult bears, the teenagers of the bear world. And Cheryl, I think you have some information to share about 131 and uh, that bear's ability to get fat. Yeah, sure. So as we kind of mentioned earlier, subadult bears are essentially the teenagers of the bear world. Um, they are bears that have been emancipated from their mom. Um, they are on their own, basically, for the first time ever. Um, they usually age, are aged between like two and a half years to three and a half years when they get emancipated. Um, and that's a pretty young time for bears to be out on their own. Um, and so these subadult bears, um, like competitor 131, who, with the exception of the 132 cub, is actually the youngest bear in this competition. Um, Subadults face a lot of challenges as they navigate life on their own. Uh, they're usually some of the lowest ranking bears on the bear hierarchy, uh, which can make gaining the weight they need to during the summer all the more difficult. Um, smaller subadults like 131, um, they can't really compete for the prime fishing spots that you see a lot of the really big guys up at the falls trying to get into, um, like the jacuzzi or the office, or even up at the lip fishing. Um, so they basically have to learn quickly how to adapt their fishing habits um, and find the best resources that they can to help them gain the weight that they need to. Um, sometimes for these younger bears, that means um, learning to fish in other parts of the river that they didn't fish with with their mom, um, like the lower river. Uh, sometimes they fish in the riffles area as well. Um, sometimes all they can really get their paws on um, are scraps from other bears that eventually float down river. Um, they eat that a lot. And oftentimes towards the end of the summer, um, getting closer to fall, some adult bears like 131 will um, feast until they can't eat any more um, on like the dead and dying salmon that are in the river. Um, and those are good resources and excellent ways for younger bears like sub adults to kind of pack on the pounds that they need to. Um, but the habits that they develop um, as young sort of teenager bears um, on their own are really what are going to make or break them um, later on down the line as they mature into bear adulthood. Um, and even with 131, um, all of these struggles that she's had to face as a young bear on her own, she's gotten impressively fat this year. Um, you know, putting her right next to a big bear like 747, you might not think, wow, that she's not really as fat. Like, is she gonna go far in a competition like this? But when you think about all the struggles that young bears like her have to face in order to gain that weight, um, it's incredibly impressive. Um, she is not getting to sit at the falls and just gorge herself on fish after fish after fish all day. She's really having to work harder uh, to get the pounds that she needs to. Um, and, you know, one of the cool things about having the Explorer bear cams is we get to see these younger bears as they grow up and as they mature into adulthood. Um, and as that happens, she will, you know, continue to face a whole new set of challenges as, as each year comes upon her. Um, Naomi, do you want to tell us what it's like for some of these other uh, younger bears that are really starting to just sort of enter into bear adulthood and what it's like for them to try and pack on these pounds? Yeah, um, it, the stories change as, as they age. Um, and we have some very interesting young adult bears in this competition. Um, we have bear 812, who is six years old, and bear 503, who is eight. And these are brothers from different litters. But um, look how, how much weight these young bears have, this young bear has gained. And, um, but when, when you have a young adult bear like 503 or 812, they're not only growing out, they are also grow, growing up. So you see that 503 here is a very tall bear and so is bear 812 and so, um, the fat and the calories that they are eating during the summer not only goes to uh, making them fat so they can survive hibernation in the early spring, but it goes into making them bigger because these guys have a lot more growing to do. I mean, bears keep growing into their middle to uh, late teens. So um, bears to watch and fat means not just surviving the winter, but um, 
surviving adulthood later on. And another bear that's an interesting contrast to this is bear 151, who's 14 years old, in his prime. And um, he is really fat. And if you ask 151's life with 503 and 812's life, it's very interesting because we I always just thought of, of Walker 151 as a small bear. But he's obviously not that now. But his frame is a lot smaller than 812's or 503s. Now, part of that's genetics, but part of that is that 503 and 812 have grown up along the river in a time of plenty when they have had so much salmon to fuel their growth. So I think that if 151 perhaps had grown up in an equivalent time to 503 and 812, maybe he would not only be that fat, but he would be bigger as well. So um, the bears, um, Bears work hard, the environment really affects them, and, um, and uh, getting fat is different things to also male and female. I want to tell us a little bit about what getting fat means to the male bears. It certainly means they have a better chance of gaining access to the resources they need, such as uh, productive feeding areas. And we see this frequently at Brooks Falls when bears jostle for position in an effort to secure a place at their preferred uh, fishing locations. Especially look for this in early summer when Brooks Falls creates the most productive places to fish when the salmon are running upstream. Body size is extremely important in helping bears establish and maintain dominance. And I think we'll pull up a clip here that, that illustrates this pretty well uh, between bear 747 and a 634 Popeye. Uh, in this clip, we'll see that 747 uh, climbs to the top of the waterfall to pursue 634 Popeye. There's a bear on the lip of the falls, doesn't want to have anything to do with these two big guys that are going to, going to get into a confrontation. Now, Popeye really doesn't have many places to go because 747 was so eager to confront him. And now he's really up against uh, 747 and the lip of the waterfall. 747 in this situation wanted to reaffirm his dominance over Popeye and he succeeded. Popeye was okay, so don't worry about him. But if 747 wasn't significantly larger than Popeye, then 747's ability to establish and maintain his dominance in that situation would not have been so easy. And we can also look at body size from a different perspective. It's just not the most dominant bears that find it useful. Uh, you think about Otis. Uh, he's a remarkable bear in many ways. He's one of the best anglers at the river, uh, and his change in body size reflects that. Uh, we, uh, you know, have saw Otis right here in late July looking fairly skinny uh, for that time of the year, and he looks nothing like this now. He's gained an impressive amount of weight in two months. Uh, however, Otis also tells us a story about how body fat really isn't everything. Other bears uh, seem to recognize that even though he is very fat, he is not much of a threat to them anymore. Uh, for example, here we'll see 812 walk by Otis without much acknowledgement. And that's not something 812 would necessarily do with some of the larger and more dominant bears like Chunk, like Walker, uh, like uh, 747, for instance, and, and Popeye. So Otis remains a large-bodied bear, yet he faces a revolving door of younger bears who want, who want access to the same things as him. The more body mass Otis can gain and the more he can maintain, the easier it will be for him to compete for the resources that he needs to survive. On a day-to-day -day basis, fat helps bears survive. Yet, Leon, it's also vitally important to uh, their reproductive success. Absolutely. And when you think about sows with cubs, they face extra challenges. Um, so take 128 and 435, for instance, the energetic toll of raising a litter is quite large. And you really see that they really need ample fat reserves in order to do this. And so, yes, both of their yearlings now, they are eating salmon, but they are still nursing as well. And Bear's milk is one of the highest percentage of fat. It is incredibly rich, um, about 20% fat by volume in comparison to humans, which is three to 5%. And sows, they often have to use their own fat in order to and metabolize that um, to produce such rich milk. But other than just nursing as well, they have to think about behavioral choices and adjusting as well. So 
take 435 for instance last year her cub was injured by a porcupine and so they had to really adjust behavior they 435 and her cub they were more constrained on where they would fish so they make these choices based on their children too so you always have to think about that and in some ways they have to think about the access they have to their fishing spots now take 128 for instance and her yearlings she is known to be one of the most assertive and protective moms along the river and you'll see here um, in different interactions that she has that often she will preemptively confront other bears, including those that are larger, large adult dominant males as well. But she doesn't necessarily do this all the time. When she is single without cubs, she doesn't need to spend that extra energy to always protect them, to go out of her way to show her dominance. But surely this year you can tell that her perseverance and her ability to do so has really given her and her cubs a real advantage and has given her access to her preferred fishing spots. So yes, moms definitely face additional challenges, but what about those single females out there, Cheryl? Sweet. Yeah. Um, let's talk about single female adult bears. Um, we do have one um, on our bracket this year, uh, Bear 402, who I know a lot of folks are familiar with because she has been using the Brooks River um, for many, 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 many years. Um, but for adult female bears like her, um, their fatness or lack of fat um, is sort of directly related to not just their ability to survive through hibernation, uh, but also their ability to support any cubs that they might have. Um, female bears that mate during early summer uh, won't enter a gestation period unless they uh, wind up gaining enough weight over the course of the summer to support both her and any cubs that she might have. Um, and since, bo sorry, since cubs are born in the den during hibernation, sows can really only give birth if they've gained enough body weights and are healthy enough to support both them um, and the cubs that'll be born during the hibernation. Um, that process is called delayed implantation, and it basically ensures that uh, female bears will not become pregnant unless they are healthy enough to do so, uh, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so really for female bears, uh, gaining as much weight as they can throughout the course of the summer is more imperative really, you know, than their male counterparts because they are potentially supporting not only themselves, but any babies that they might have um, during the course of the winter. And Bear 402 is a great example of a bear that does this. Um, she is one of the largest bears that fishes at the river um, including other male bears. Um, and she's produced more litters than any other uh, female bear that we currently know that frequents the river. Um, and part of that is because she is extremely successful at getting nice and chunky uh, during the summer. And, uh, you know, that has undoubtedly contributed to her ability to support uh, many litters of cubs. Um, she's also one of the only sows that we frequently see uh, coming back with four cubs. Um, you don't see them that with that many as often, um, but I think that that might be in part of how successful she is at gaining a lot of weight during the summer um, is she's gaining this weight and it's giving her the ability to support herself um, and the cubs that she has while she's in the den. Um, but, you know, we can't really talk about fatness and successful of fatness of being fat, sorry, <laughs> um, without equating um, or talking about some of the big boys that frequent the river, uh, the bears that we normally you know, think of when we think of super fat bears that fish at Brooks. Um, Mike, you know these bears very well. Um, why don't you tell us about some of the river's fattest? Well, male bears, they don't raise offspring um, like, like female bears. Uh, so that's a, a job that's completely up, left up to the moms. But fat is also really important to the reproductive success of male bears. For a moment, um, let's consider chunk. Uh, you know, number 32, he's uh, a large brown bear in the prime of his life, probably weighs about 1,200 pounds, uh, at least at our best guess. His body size allows him to compete for the limited mating opportunities available in the spring. Bears are very good at resolving conflict without fighting, but sometimes body size and posturing can't do that. Uh, and some of the most violent fights that male bears experience are during the mating season. The muzzle wound that Chunk got earlier this year could have been from a fight between him and another male for a chance to court a female bear. And there's evidence from other bear populations that suggests that uh, the bigger you are, and sometimes if you're, you know, a mature or one of those slightly older bears, you know, in your um, middle to late teens or in your early twenties, and of course, if you're more dominant, 
uh, that you might sire more offspring than younger and smaller adult males. So bears in our competition this year who might kind of fit that category would be bears like Chunk, like Popeye, like uh, 747, uh, and perhaps also, you know, Walker as he's um, getting into that, that, uh, that size where he's uh, able to compete with um, the limited mating opportunities. And th that's in comparison to some of the smaller adult males, like 503 and 812. I mean, they're adults, so mating is certainly on their mind, but maybe they don't have the body mass or necessarily the fat reserves in the springtime to kind of help fuel their pursuit of females. Because the fat reserves of both older and younger adult males really does help to provide the energy to sustain them in their springtime courting efforts. There often isn't a lot of food available to bears in Katmai in the springtime when the mating season begins. And even if there is, male bears might forego feeding opportunities to focus on courting behavior. They need energy to do this and their remaining fat reserves, fat that I might add they accumulated the year before, is often that source of energy. The bears at Brooks River in Fat Bear Week demonstrate in a variety of ways how fat is important to their individual survival. And in Naomi, those stories are enshrined with previous Fat Bear Week winners. Yeah, we um, really can't launch this year's Fat Bear Week without talking about um, the roster of previous champions um, and um, amazing bears they are and were. Um, three of those bears are in the current bracket. Um, 480 Otis was the um, the inaugural and original Fat Bear Week champion or Fat Bear Tuesday champion. And he won twice at the in King Salmon. Um, and, um, and then, so um, we also have Holly who won in 2019, and 747 who is our reigning champion. And, Beat Nose brings out a very interesting aspect to being fat and the, the difficult life of bears. Beat Nose, as you can see here, was extraordinarily successful in getting fat and surviving winters and having, having cubs um, and, and um, living to a good ripe bear's age. But we haven't seen her since 2018 and she left in 2018 a very fat bear. So as we celebrate the success of these bears and being fat and surviving and thriving, there, there's more to their survival than just being fat. So um, I, we want to pay tribute to the, ba the bears who have won before, and we want everyone to participate to enthusiastically crown the champion for 2021. Mike, Cheryl, Leon, I think it's uh, time to celebrate Fat Bear Week 2021. Mike, you want to uh, conclude here for us? Most certainly. Um, it is a time of celebration. Uh, and you can cast your Fat Bear Week vote at fatbearweek.org. Again, we have polls open today until 9 p.m. Eastern time. So get over there if you haven't cast your vote yet. And then the polls open tomorrow with two other matchups. Uh, at nine, or excuse me, at 12 noon Eastern time uh, tomorrow. And as a fuel for a bear's reproductive success and overall survival, it is hard to overstate the importance of fat. Learning about and considering the different ways that bears get fat and why they do so is, uh, I think, a way to appreciate and honor the bears during Fat Bear Week. And Fat Bear Week is a celebration of them. It's also a celebration of the salmon and the health of Katmai and the Bristol Bay ecosystem. Bears are a conspicuous example of that area's productivity and ability to support the last great salmon run on earth and some of the largest and densest bear populations anywhere in the world. Young and old bears need ample fat reserves to survive winter hibernation. Pregnant bears need fat to give birth and nurse their cubs while still hibernating. In the spring, a bear's remaining fat reserves are needed to sustain them during a time of year that typically has little reliable food. Fat also helps bears maintain large body size and in turn establish dominance and compete with other bears for limited resources. So as you cast your Fat Bear Week votes, consider the challenges each bear must overcome to get fat and what fat means to its individual survival. Rangers, thanks so much uh, for joining me today. It's been a, a fun chat and I'm always uh, glad to be able to share this space with you and, and learn from your insights.
Thank you. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure, Mike. <laughs> Uh, I think we might have time for maybe a couple of questions if you also have time to, to hang out and, and try to ponder a few audience questions. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, well, let's do it. you know, this, the, yeah, the first thing that actually came up in our <laughs> queue here is, is more of a demand rather than a, <laughs> rather than a question because it has that exclamation point at the end. So I guess I have to do it. So if somebody's wondering about this shirt, I'm very fond of wearing the same clothing every day. I don't really care. But this shirt, actually, you can get through the Cat My Conservancy, um, Fat Bear Champion 747. Um, and you can pre-order a t-shirt if you want to uh, for this week's Fat Bear Week Champion. Just go to catmyconservancy.org. If you need a t-shirt, uh, that option is available to you there. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, <laughs> uh, we have uh, several more questions in our queue here, and I'll try to throw these to uh, maybe this uh, first one to you, Rangers. Um, this one's about Otis, because you've had the opportunity uh, to see Otis in person at Brooks River this September. And I didn't travel to Brooks River this September, but somebody's wondering about your best estimate of what 480 Otis weighed when he arrived versus his current um, wait, I think last year in 2020, the, the bear LIDAR scans estimated Otis to be around a thousand pounds. Uh, I'm wondering if you think he's about the same size as last year. Um, I'll, I'll take this one, Mike, since I, um, saw Otis and when he arrived that evening and he was very skinny. I mean, he, it was late July, July 26th. And it meant that he really hadn't had much to eat at all since the previous year. Um, so um, he, his, his ribs were showing um, and he's gained a lot. I would think he's probably, he's not what he was in size last year, but I'd say eight or 900 pounds. I mean, that's pure guesstimate, but he really did an amazing job in a shorter amount of time. I mean, it's a tribute to the knowledge of age and um, the Zen master who knows how to eat more and move less and gain a lot of weight. <laughs> and I would add to that too, like even in now, the picture we used in his fat picture, right? He is still eating at Brooks. We see him on the cams all the time and he has gained even more weight since we did take that fat picture too. Yeah, if any bear uh, threatens to blow up my bracket, it's Otis. So we'll see if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, that's a that's a that that's a matchup that I'm looking forward to. I'm I'm looking to see where the Otis fans take him uh, this year, and I know they're campaigning <laughs> very very hard uh, for their favorite bear. Uh, another question uh, here. This one's about a young adult male. How long um, before five zero three really grows into that massive brain? Five zero three is a fun bear to watch because he is growing quite quickly. Uh, but what might we expect out of him? in the next several years. Well, I think, Naomi, you were talking about 151 Walker earlier um, and how when he was younger, he was sort of much, a much smaller bear. Um, and I think it was really within the past five or six years that he really sort of exploded in girth. Um, I would probably expect a similar thing to happen to Bear 503 because um, he is extremely tall. He's got very long legs. Um, so if he can sort of, I think like, keep up with the eating um he will end up being an absolutely massive bear um but just based off of the age he is now i would say maybe three to five years before we really see like peak fatness on that bear yeah and he's also my, i mean again yeah. a, a lot of that energy is going into his growing up and he's also getting more serious about his fishing um you you notice that he's gain, gaining size and also um he is not as friendly to other bears as he used to be. He's a very known for being a very social bear. And um, now that he has more size, um, 747 is very uh, conscious of what 503 does. So um, I, I agree with you. I think um, he's eight now. So probably in his mid teens is uh, when we're gonna see this humongous bear. And I would echo, I think, yeah, those, um those remarks within my experience to give a, a an example of a bear who is in fat bear week now but when he was seven years old you never would have guessed that he would grow into the giant that he is today and that's 747 747 at that time he was just kind of like one of those goofy young adult males that we saw 
around the river. He was really good at fishing, but he was just sort of like in the mix of all the other bears. Um, and there was really nothing to indicate from him that I saw at least, maybe I missed it, but that he was going to get as large as he is uh, today. So yeah, we I think we can definitely see uh, or expect to see some different things from 503 coming up over the next uh, several years. And he could be a very, very large bear. It'll be uh, interesting to watch. Uh, we do have a question yes, from but... Ethan, who's, uh, uh, sorry, Cheryl, go ahead. Oh, I just was throwing in there, especially if he grows into those legs, because that bear has got some long legs. <laughs> <laughs> he is very tall and um and ethan is wondering actually a question that probably we should have answered in the live chat today but maybe that was an oversight on our part and we didn't actually um uh provide this information i don't think during this live chat but he's wondering why do bears hibernate uh so so rangers uh can you give us a, a quick rundown of what bears uh, are doing when they go into hibernation and why well i'll take the sure. why Go for it, Naomi. Because the why to me is easy. Um, well, I mean, why not hibernate when there's no food around? I mean, you know, you don't want to be wandering around in the cold or um, or even not the cold because bears in Florida hibernate as well. Um, but um, you, there's no food. So um, it's time to uh, slow down that metabolism and use the stored fat and... Um, and wait till there's food. Yeah, they go through physiological and metabolic changes um, that really we don't necessarily quite fully understand. Um, they are able to basically their temperature drops slightly, but what you really see a difference in is their heart rate and their breathing. And they are able to emerge incredibly healthy compared to if a human were to do the same thing. They are remarkable creatures in so many ways when they are hibernating. So humans couldn't couldn't do the same thing, uh, but they're avoiding wintertime famine. Uh, they do it remarkably well. They come out of the den healthy. So uh, great, Kristen, Ethan, um, and that's an important part to consider why uh, you know bears are are getting as fat as they are and how they do it. And I think we have time for maybe for one more question here, and this is one that I have pondered frequently. Uh, I actually wrote a blog post about this for Explore.org a couple of years ago, but somebody was wondering, would too much fat do harm to the bear's health? And in short, I don't think a bear could be too fat unless it was so <laughs> fat it couldn't couldn't walk. Uh, yeah. Because when you think about yeah, when you think about um, bears in comparison to other animals, um, like if you were a, a, a marmot, for instance, or a ground squirrel, if you get fat, that might help you to survive. Um, hibernation, but you're also more vulnerable to predators. You're, uh, you know, a little fat animal that you're going to be a, an enticing target for something like a wolf <laughs> or a brown bear or a wolverine or something like that. Uh, but brown bears are so large, they really don't have to worry about predators. So they don't have to worry about um, slowing down and becoming more vulnerable to a predator because they are so fat. And then they also don't experience the, um, the health effects that obesity causes in people. So they're not necessarily experiencing heart disease, for instance. Um, they may become insulin resistant, but it seems like they reverse that um, sometime during hibernation. So they don't experience, you know, effects from diabetes like a human would. I mean, it is really, uh, they're remarkable animals in so many ways, but I don't think a, a bear can be too fat. Um, Rangers, I don't know if you have a different opinion on that, but it seems like they do pretty well with all that girth. I think, I mean, yeah, even... No, I was just going to say, Nancy. on the edge of that is 747 really trying hard to get up a hill when he is at the end. Of I the was going to say the same thing. So, <laughs> he, yeah. It's like, talk about, well, maybe too fat if they can't walk and, and get to the den. I, I, he makes it, but boy, he's so fat. I mean, <laughs> his tummy, you know, scraping the ground. So, uh, you know, I, I think there, there might be, you know, a limit there. Um, Mike, I have a, one more question for you. Okay. Um, so since we're discussing your wardrobe and your 747's publicist, where is your 747 hat? Oh, you know what? I <laughs> forgot it, for, um, but it's right on the shelf over here um, nearby. So um, we'll, uh, maybe we'll bring it out for later 
in um, our future <laughs> Factor Week broadcast. Maybe if 747 makes it to the finals. So that'll be everyone's motivation um, to vote for 747 this year if you want to see uh, that happen. <laughs> no prejudice there. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, Rangers, thanks so much for um, joining me again today. It's been um, great to talk with you about Fat Bear Week, and I'm looking forward to a successful celebration of bears over the next several days. My co-hosts for this live chat brought to you by Explore.org and Katmai National Park and the Katmai Conservancy were Katmai National Park Park Rangers Naomi Volk, uh, Cheryl Spencer, and Leon Law. So thanks very much for being here. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. Please be well and be sure to vote in Fat Bear Week. We'll talk to you later.